Well, apparently the 308 Winchester is America's favorite cartridge. So why don't we dedicate the entire week to the 308 Winchester? That's right. Forget about sharks. This is 308 Winchester week. Hello everyone, Ron Spomer here, and yes, I really am going to dedicate the week to the 308 Winchester. And everyone knows this is not my favorite cartridge, but you can't fight City Hall, and you cannot fight the most popular cartridge in America. Well, it might not sell as many models as the 22 Rimfire, or maybe even the 223 Remington 5.56 NATO, but by golly, for a deer hunting round, for a mid-caliber, it seems to be the king. And whether that means it's the most loved hunting round, or maybe it's more the most beloved target round, hardly matters because it is widely accepted and for good reason. But what I want to do in this introduction to 308 Winchester Week, before we go out in the field and start shooting nine different rifles chambered for the 308, I want to talk a little bit about of its genesis, its history. Where did it come from? Was it really built from the 300 Savage? We're going to find out all about the 308 Winchester and hope we nail it down once and for all. And if we don't, we might have to do another 308 Winchester Week. So hang in there. First of all, where did that 308 come from? Most people seem to think that it's the 300 Savage that is the parent cartridge, and here it is. But if you look closely, you will see that the 300 Savage is shorter than the 308. And when you've got a short cartridge, it's a little bit harder to make it long. Whereas if you start with a 30 out 6 and shorten it, it's a little bit easier. Well, actually, both of these played a role. And not only that, but the 250 Savage played a role. How did all this come down? Charles Newton took the 30 out 6, modified it, made the 250 Savage, the 250 3000, first cartridge to push a bullet faster than 3000 feet per second. Woohoo, big stuff. That was about 1911. 1925, Savage took that case, modified it, fattened it up a little bit made it a 30 caliber, there's your 300 Savage, an improvement over the 3030. Then came the, well, the 30 out 6 was already out there because if you look at the head size and the rim size on all of these, they're all the same, 0.473 inch in diameter. One can argue then that the 30 out 6 is the parent of all of them. But then you can argue that the 857 Mauser is the parent of the 30 odd six. <laughs> it's a big family. At any rate, what they did with the 300 Savage was looked at it. The military did this, and it started way back in World War II when they realized the logistics of carrying around these big loads of 30 odd six ammunition and shooting them in that M1 Garand rifle could have been a little more efficient. Logistically, they wanted lighter rifles, lighter cartridges, less recoil, and they thought they needed to start looking for that. So during the war in 1944, the ordnance officer for our U.S. military charged the ballisticians at Frankfurt Arsenal in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to come up with a new service rifle and cartridge. And that's the genesis of the 308. They started looking at the 300 Savage, thinking that might just be the ticket. But it didn't quite do what they wanted it to do. So they had this program called T-65. That was all of the research to find this new cartridge. And because the uh, Savage was a little bit thinner um, in the case than the uh, .30-06, they wanted a little bit thicker case, so they started working with the .30-06 and not necking it down, shortening it to make the 308. So they both played a role as parent cartridges. Um, but the uh, 300 Savage only had a map, maximum average chamber pressure, of 47,000 PSI. Well, the 308 that emerged from this whole T65 program has a 62,000 PSI pressure limit. So it's got to be a little bit thicker case, I would think, to withstand all those pressures. So that's why I think the 30 out 6 was eventually used to shorten it down and make the 308. Notice also that the neck on the 300 Savage is quite a bit shorter. That's only a 0.22 inch length neck that's less than one caliber the 308 is a 0.303 inch length neck that's 
full caliber, long enough to really hold those bullets in line during rough handling. You don't want the bullet to get canted in that mouth. So it's another reason I think they went with the 30 out 6 to make the 308. At any rate, after several years of playing around with all these different options, Winchester got wind of this whole program, saw the 51 millimeter length case and figured that's probably the one the military was going to choose because it was producing the velocity they wanted. 150 grain bullet, about 2,750 feet per second. Pretty much matched the 30 at six of the day. So they were pretty excited about that. Winchester jumped the gun. In 1952, they came out with a civilian version 308 Winchester. The military didn't tumble to it until 1954. They finally accepted it as the official uh, around for the military, and it was going to be in the new M14 rifle, which was sort of a improved Garand. Instead of the M1 Garand with a full length for the 30-06, they shortened everything up, lightened it up a little bit, had their new rifle, put it into service. NATO didn't adopt this thing until 1957. That's when it became the 7.62 by 51 millimeter NATO that we all know. When the U.S. military took it to Vietnam, problems. Jungles, rain, moisture, wood stocks on that M14 swelled. They were having all kinds of problems. And it was still pretty heavy and bulky. The interesting thing about the 308 Winchester and the 7.62 NATO that thing was only in the official military infantry rifle for 10 years. By 1964, it got bumped by the 223 or the 5.56 NATO in the M16, the AR style rifle. So for all of its fame and glory, that 308 really didn't last all that long. Now, they did keep it in the line for some machine guns and some other uses, and it was put into a modified Remington 700 as a sniper rifle from which it got its reputation as a sniping round. But really, we're going to see that it's not all that great for a long-range sniping round. Plenty good inside of, we'll say, 400, maybe 500 yards. But boy, you get to 600 and beyond, it starts to have some problems. And we're going to see why here in this uh, entire episode before we go out and shoot it. (laughs) So there's where the uh, 308 came from. Now, Winchester first chambered this in 1952 in its Model 70 featherweight rifle. 22-inch barrel, nice and light and handy. The crazy thing, though, was the 308 Winchester established what is now known as the short action cartridges, the length of 2.8 inches, head to toe, right to the tip of that bullet. That's the length. But Winchester's rifle was a standard 30-06 length chamber. They didn't even have a short action in those days. That's how new it was. Now, in 1955, they made a short action model 88 lever action rifle, and they chambered it in the 308 and the 243, and then subsequently all of the uh, the short action cartridges. But I think it's kind of funny to think of the first short action 308 was in a long action rifle. So Savage 99s were chambered in it, and pretty soon, Everyone was chambering. It didn't take off like a rocket because so many hunters already had their 3030s and 270s and 30 out sixes and uh, seven rem mags were coming in in 1962 and there was a lot of a lot of options out there. So, and the really the 308 length action that whole idea that we love these days of the short action cartridges that wasn't a big deal back then either. So it was kind of a whole hum. But it gradually picked up steam until everybody was chambering it. Police departments picked it up as a sniper rifle after learning that the military were using it in these modified Remingtons. And it's got its reputation for accuracy. And there's a little bit of myth, I think, behind it being an inherently accurate cartridge. Yes, it's accurate, but I don't see anything in its configurations that would make it super accurate. Some people say, well, it's because it's short, so the bulk of the powder column is closer to the primer, the ignition source, so you get a more efficient burn. You're not burning powder at the back and then pushing a big column of powder out the barrel ahead of it. That might be true, but if that's the case, and that makes for inherent accuracy, the 300 SOM and the 300 WSM cartridges, being shorter and fatter, have a priming source closer to the center of their powder, and they don't have this reputation for being superiorly accurate like the 308 does. And even the Savage, being a little bit shorter, would 
probably be more accurate for that reason. So I don't know that that's really a part of the deal. Now, what about the shoulder angle? It's a 30 degree angle on the Savage. These days that's considered sort of the optimum for an efficient burn in the cartridge. There's a 20 degree angle on the 308. So that doesn't lend itself to what might be part of the inherently accurate cartridge. I do like the fact that it's got a full caliber neck for keeping that bullet perfectly aligned. That might be part of it. But I think the real reason that the 308 has a reputation for being super accurate is because of the rifles that it's built for. They just chamber those so often with match grade barrels because a lot of a lot of target shooters like that round. And it's efficient. It doesn't burn out your barrel. So you can shoot it a lot before your barrel needs to be retired. So it's great for target shooting. As for long range sniping, we're going to look at some ballistic numbers that kind of put a lie to that. And before we do that, we'll talk about one more thing. Here's the thing with the 30 out 6 versus the 308. So many people insist that because of new powders and bullets, the 308 is equal to or better than the 30 out 6, meaning ballistic performance. And it's just not true. It is true that when it was formed back in the 50s, it was doing what the 30 out 6 at that time was doing. But these days with new powders, well, you can put those same new powders in a 30 out 6 and because you have more volume, you're going to get higher velocity regardless of the pressures. 62,000 PSI, I think, on the 308 and only 60,000 on the 30 out 6. Might be wrong on that, but I think those are the accurate numbers. But still, with that much more powder, consistently, you look at ammunition and different loads, you might find one particular 308 load that's a little faster than an equivalent 30 out 6 with the same bullet. But overall, you're getting an average of 100 feet per second more velocity out of the 30 out 6. And that increases slightly as you go up in bullet weight. And that's one of the problems with the 308 and why it is not the ultimate long range sniping round, despite its accuracy reputation. And let's look at some ballistic numbers now to see that. Now, I'm going to do something that most of you are going to hate. I'm going to bring up this infamous guy, the 6.5 Creedmoor to compare against the 308 again. But if you hate that 6.5 Creedmoor, let's just say it's the 6.5 by 55 Swede this time. We'll get the Savage over here by the 250. These are the guys. This thing can actually outperform in some measures the 308 Winchesters. I'm not dissing the 308, guys. I'm just giving you actual data. This is physics and this stuff doesn't lie. You've got ballistics coefficients and muzzle velocities and bullet weights and they all play a role in ballistic performance. That's what we want to look at. Now I've often compared the 308 using 150 grain bullet because it's just such a popular round for, for deer hunters in the 308. But a lot of guys will say, well, that's not fair because it's not a high BC bullet. You really need to go with 165 or 168. We'll do that. 168 grain bullet here with a BC of 0.475. Uh, bullet weight 168. We're going to drive it to 2,904 feet per second, which is really fast. It's the fastest hand load I could find in the different hand load manuals. Um, finding factory ammunition that fast is pretty hard to do. So I'm giving it the benefit of the doubt here. Now we're going to get out of that volume uh, 3,146 foot-pounds of energy. Pretty impressive stuff. But as I said, we're going to compare it against that lousy little 6.5 using 143, 142 grain bullet there. The BC on that is 0.625. We can only drive that about 2,750 feet per second. Some hand loaders can nudge that up a bit. But again, we're giving the uh, benefit of the doubt here to the 308. And that's what we're going to use for our comparisons. Now, initially, the 308's got a lot more energy. And this is what I would recommend and choose for more punch on game, bigger diameter bullet, heavier weight, and all the rest of it, you've got the advantage right there. But do note that because of the BC factor here, you're going to get more retained energy out of that little 6.5 bullet down range. But does it matter? That's the big question. And it happens at 725 yards. That's a long way out there. But it does get, show us what, what ballistics do and why BC matters. Even though we're starting this 6.5 off at 2,750 feet per second and the 308 bullet at 2,900 feet per second, at 725 yards, the velocity is just about exactly the same. Yep. No, the energy is. The velocity is actually an advantage to the 6.5 Creedmoor. The remaining velocity at 725 yards is 1,775 feet per second. And in that 308, it's down to 1,664. 
But even with a lighter weight bullet in the 6.5, they're both landing with 1,032 foot-pounds of energy at that extreme distance. This is what BC does for you guys. You can't argue it. Now, you also have an advantage for wind deflection. Right angle wind, 10 miles an hour. Because of the higher BC bullet on that 6.5, it deflects less in the wind. At 725 yards, you've got about 33 inches of deflection out of the 6.5. And you've got 43 inches out of the 308. And this is why the 308 can't win the long-range competitions on targets as effectively as these 6.5s with that velocity. Wind deflection is usually what costs you. You can figure out your drops, and they're pretty consistent because gravity is consistent. But the wind changes a little bit. And when you've got that stodgier bullet that doesn't have the high BC, that's why it loses out to the 6.5s. And not just the Creedmoor and the Swede, but several others. You just increase your velocity and your BC, and that's what wins. Now, the argument against that is, why don't you use a higher BC bullet in the 308? That would show its, its oats. All right, we'll do that. We'll go with a... 190 grain bullet now. That should really do the trick, right? Well, you're definitely going to have more energy on target. Uh, you're starting off with 2,912 foot-pounds of energy. Not as much, by the way, as you had with that 168, but you're going to hang on to it a little bit better. So once again, let's just jump right out there to 725 yards. And now we're seeing that our energy is remaining 1,178 foot-pounds with the... Uh, big 190 grain bullet and with the 6.5 we're down to 1032 same as with the 168 so you do have more energy with that bigger bullet now let's look at wind deflection the bc on this 190 grain bullet it's an acubon long range it's pretty high 0.597 but that's not as high as 0.625 out of that 143 grain bullet in the 6.5 as a result i think we're going to see a less wind deflection in that 6.5. 725 yards, we've got 37 and a half inches of wind deflection out of the 190 grain bullet in the 308. And we have 33 out of the 6.5. Once again, the, the 6.5 wins. But the energy is retained much better in that heavier bullet. And that, I think, is the point that most 308 shooters, especially the hunters, are making. The 308 might not hang on to as much energy way out there, but who's taking game at 700 yards plus anyway? Sensible hunting distances out to 400, maybe 500 yards, you've got more energy in your 308 bullet. You might have to compensate a little bit for more wind deflection, but most of us are taking our game inside of 300 yards, in which case the wind deflection isn't that big of a deal, and the 308 is, I think, your winner. A heavier bullet always wants to penetrate better than a lighter bullet. Um, obviously, the construction of the bullet makes a difference, but boy, you sure can't argue that 308. So why is this 308 so bloody popular? I think part of the reason is so many people shoot it in the military. Even today now, they're still shooting it in the um, in some of the auto-loading rifles, the full automatics. And it's going to be phased out, I think, by that 277 coming in. But for now, they're still hanging on to it. Even after the 223 5.56 came out in 64, there were still a lot of 308s being used, especially in those modified 700 Remington sniper rifles. But it never was the ultimate sniping round. I think most of us understand that because of this increased wind deflection. Remember Carlos Whitefeather Hancock, Hathcock? He was the Vietnam-era sniper who had the most kills and famous for it. He chose a Model 70 Winchester in 30 out 6 for most of his work, not the 308. <laughs> so that kind of tells the tale right there. I think the reason the 308 has this reputation for a sniper round is because so many police departments choose it for urban settings where you don't really shoot all that far. You're just interested in precision. And the precision comes from the match grade rifles and ammunitions built for it. So that is the history and a little bit of the ballistic performance of the 308. Regardless what you think of it all, if you love the 308 because it's just such a grand middle of the road cartridge, suitable for deer especially, but fast enough to use on longer range pronghorns and other open country game like that. Enough oomph and power uh, for deep penetration on elk and moose. It's really been used for just about any and every animal around the world, a lot like the 30 out 6 It's just that you get it in a lighter weight rifle, a little bit shorter. It's a little more convenient. So if you love the 308, 
no problem. We're going to take you out to the range and see which rifles it's chambered in and which one you might like. We've got nine to choose from. We're going to put three against each other for each episode, find out which one we choose. And then at the end, we're going to pick the three winners and put them head to head and see which one both I and my friend Chase, who's bringing eight rifles up with him. <laughs> I'm just contributing one. I don't have that many 308s. And we're going to see just how well the 308 does, how consistent Consistently it shoots, how accurately it shoots, and find out why it's one of the most popular hunting grounds in North America. So stay tuned the rest of the week, every day, a new video on the 308 Winchester. Thanks for watching. This is Ron Spomer. Hunt honest and shoot straight, even if you shoot a 308.